rebuild it. Like it's just like Chicago, but like slightly different. Like different. Like, main difference. Uh, <laughs> I love that. I love that much. Um, but yes, uh, I'm here to, as uh, Jacob mentioned to talk about we think priorities, uh, and uh, I'm going to get into uh, some examples of some work we've done over the last uh, year and a half or so, uh, and get like, this much into like what's currently going on. Uh, so yeah. Um, very broadly, as Jake mentioned, the research organization, we have existed since uh, January 2018. Uh, we are up to uh, 10 employees, uh, 8 full-time equivalent. Uh, we did a lot of uh, hiring late last year. Uh, and very broadly, I think it's going well working on neglected tractable problems. Uh, as you mentioned, I'll, I'll get much more into what that really looks like in practice. And uh, this very broadly, we try to do work that other organizations either haven't done uh, or haven't prioritized, but that we think are still very decision relevant for funders, for uh, other EA aligned organizations. Um, so, uh, very broadly, uh, what, what does this look like in practice? Uh, so, currently, we're doing within intervention research. Uh, so, if some of you are familiar with that uh, very broadly, uh, uh, there's a a handful of causes people are into, global poverty, animal welfare, uh, existential risk, whether it be from AI or virus. Um, and instead of trying to cross compare the causes against each other, which is often very difficult for a number of reasons, we're very interested in de delving deep into some of them to uh, get uh, more robust evidence uh, for some of these possible interventions within these spaces. Uh, so uh, we're largely working on animals, uh, uh, maybe 8% or so. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to focus on animals today. Uh, Luisa Rodriguez, who's a New Yorker who uh, has actually been in Europe for several months now. Uh, some of you may know, uh, works on nuclear weapons with us as well. But I'm, I'm largely going to ignore that, but feel free to fire away questions at me about that work at the end. Um, so, yeah, so the two examples I'm going to talk about today are, I think, are kind of representative of the types of work we do, though uh, uh, some of you may not be that familiar with the, the contents of uh, uh, the topics. So fish stocking, I'm going to explain what that is. Invertebrate sentience, again, if you're not familiar with the word sentience, I'll also get to explain what that is. Uh, so very broadly, I'm going to begin by discussing our work on fish stocking, which we published earlier this year. Ah, so yes, uh, this is an example of fish stocking. This is a, a fisherman literally dumping fish into a river, uh, and very broadly the practice is the idea of raising fish in uh, hatcheries to then later be released into the wild. Uh, whether it be rivers, lakes, or oceans. Uh, there are a number of reasons for this, um, but uh, in this, which I'll get into, but in, in this domain, uh, what our research was bro broadly just uh, information gathering, uh, because no one else had done it, it seemed valuable, and uh, it's part of a larger effort to count animals, uh, something I'm going to touch on briefly at the end of the talk. Uh, and I'll get a bit into what our actual takeaway, takeaways were from this work. Um, yeah, so one of the reasons we prioritized this was there just are a lot of uh, fish to the raising domain. Uh, so the estimates vary wide, uh, something like 35 to 150 billion. Uh, and uh, that's a huge number every year uh, raised in this fashion. Uh, and it's very comparable to fish that are uh, raised in, in, uh, through aquaculture practices just for uh, uh, human consumption. Uh, and, and it is uh, captures very widely the, the number of land animals uh, slaughtered every year. So uh, the fact that no one had really done a lot of deep dive into a global analysis of this topic a big problem. Um, very broadly, there are a number of reasons for uh, fish stocking. Uh, primarily, this is done to increase the, the wild catch of uh, commercial fishermen. Uh, but it's also just done for recreational purposes. And uh, uh, one, one other reason why this is potentially very important is uh, Solis, who was a researcher about this project, didn't find any one, any animal organization working on this more welfare perspective. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, this is primarily done for uh, commercial purposes. So, uh, think um, uh, your, your government and you want to increase the number of, of fish that are stocked because of overfishing, you try to get the level, the, the level back up. And one way to do this is to try to throw like, uh, uh, very little effort at like, raising fish uh, it, under your control and then release tons of them into the wild and hope some of them survive. And down the line, someone can catch, uh, catch fish. Uh, recreationally is a bit more, uh, like, as it suggests, not, uh, not for economic purposes, but more for people who like to fish. Uh, so there, there's actually a lot of legal 
uh, recreational fish stocking where people release fish into the, into uh, lakes and rivers so that someone else can have a slightly more pleasant fishing experience. Um, it really is that useless. Uh, and finally, the last category is, is kind of uh, where you would suspect that um, perhaps the welfare incentives are better aligned, where uh, some, some uh, conservation groups may be uh, stocking fish so that uh, natural populations may grow in the future. Uh, so, uh, again, if you have, while you're familiar with fish stocking or with fish farming in general, uh, the picture on the right there is a good example of, of how often uh, very, very young fish are stocked. Uh, so, fry up to fingerlings are, are kind of uh, the, the dominant path in uh, fish that are raised to be released into, uh, uh, for commercial purposes. Uh, and, uh, and this can vary, like, it varies quite widely by species, but uh, somewhere between uh, a few days to a few months in these, in these type of conditions. Uh, and uh, recreational fish tend to be older for some reason. If you want to increase someone's uh, fishing experience, you're not going to uh, give them a fry. Um, so, uh, slightly different, uh, slightly different purposes lead to dis different conditions for the animals. Um, so, again, if you've never seen an uh, aquaculture uh, facility, this is just kind of like a giant room which houses tons and tons of fish. In fact, if you swim real hard, you might be able to see that that sign says. Uh, 50,000 fingerlings, but that's not for the facility, that's for any of those tanks. Uh, so uh, even a warehouse like this can, can house hundreds of thousands of these animals. Um, and uh, this is another example that, that trough doesn't look very wide, it is not, and yet 30,000 fish are in each of those. Uh, so uh, even on a scale of even on a scale of an individual warehouse, you may, if, if you can find some, some welfare improvement, you may have to do a considerable amount of good. Um, uh, yeah, so this picture doesn't doesn't look great. Um, so that, that is the process of stocking. Uh, it's 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 basically at the end of the process after they uh, after they raise the fish, they release them to the wild, and sometimes it is by helicopter into a lake. Uh, it's it's uh, unclear in general how much uh, how much these type of uh, practices are uh, lead to uh, healthy untrapped fish. Uh, and it's also true when you release fish that you've raised yourself to the wild that you've been feeding for months, sometimes uh, years, in the case of fish for recreational fish. Um, it's 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 very often the case that they may starve to death because they don't know how to forage. They haven't uh, been unknown at, at all. Uh, and um, yeah, this this looks stressful. I don't know about you. I wouldn't want to be dropped in from a helicopter into the lake. Uh, so uh, this is again hilarious. <laughs> But uh, it's very uncertain what we could do about this. Uh, right now, there's uh, obviously the case that you could lobby for a reduction in the number of fish stock. Uh, however, if you, if, you, if you think that about this being used for commercial purposes, uh, if you reduce the, uh, if the wild catch is reduced, it might be counterbalanced by an increase in, in aquaculture. And it's unclear to me, at least, uh, whether which of those would be better. Uh, because obviously, uh, fish that are farmed for human consumption also don't have good conditions. Uh, so one, perhaps a better approach might be to require uh, require better conditions in the hatchery, whether that be through uh, uh, better uh, better water quality, or through uh, environment enrichment, or through uh, not feeding so many fish other fish, which is a huge concern. Uh, so um, it, there's just also because there's not a lot of people working in this place, there's tons of like basic things about learning more about what their lives are like, uh, and. Uh, and obviously, if you're releasing uh, billions of fish every year into the wild, you could stand to learn a lot more about what the ecological impacts are. Uh, having looked at some of this data, it, it's actually not, not always clear that it actually helps increase the catch, but this is something that's been going on for maybe 100 years, nonetheless. Also, just uh, currently, this uh, slide is actually slightly cut off. The bottom corner actually has a tiny URL where you can catch all my slides. Uh, cool. So, uh, given that again, that was a hilariously, hilariously brief introduction to fish stocking. Uh, I'm going to now pivot to a very simple topic, obviously, uh, invertebrate sentience. Uh, so, if you're unaware, uh, like uh, sentience is basically the concept of like there's something it's like to have an experience. Uh, so, uh, obviously, all, I'm going to assume all people in this room have uh, some some internal experiences, but also. Uh, <laughs> But also, you, most people uh, assume mammals do, your dogs, your cats. Uh, but also, uh, they're, they're just, there's, uh, there's no reason to, to particularly believe that it's a hard cutoff around mammals and birds. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things I was very interested in when I, when I started this conversation was giving a better sense of what the evidence for uh, having conscious experience, 
what's it like for uh, animals that haven't really been considered a lot? Uh, that, this picture is actually an octopus carrying two human discarded coconuts, mm -hmm. uh, which it would later use as a uh, as housing. Um, this is a very unusual behavior uh, because for a lot of reasons, uh, but because uh, for, for obvious reasons, octopuses haven't had evolutionary time scale to interact with human exposed coconut shells. Uh, so this is a good sign of their intelligence. Uh, uh, but very broadly, I'm going to again touch on uh, what we did in this, this uh, context. This is uh, uh, considerably more uh, uh, considerably more difficult uh, task than summarizing uh, this, this data. Uh, but uh, yeah, what were our conclusions? Um, are a very sentient, doesn't matter, and like what, if anything, can we do about this? Um, so very, very broadly, what is the reason I might, you might care about this? Uh, there are a lot of invertebrates, like I can't emphasize this enough. To a first approximation, all animals are invertebrates. Uh, to a first approximation, <laughs> what? all animals are nematodes, mm -hmm. right? So, but even if you exclude nematodes, uh, which are uh, like sea elegans, it's a very commonly studied, the, the, perhaps the best studied uh, creature because they have, they're very simple, they only have 300 neurons. <laughs> Uh, but even if you see those, uh, still to a first approximation, all animals are invertebrates. Uh, and uh, as uh, given that situation, it seems imperative to discover uh, whether or not these these creatures are capable of having uh, uh, capable of experiencing suffering and pleasure. Um, and uh, I'll get into this, but some invertebrates display uh, some uh, impressive cognitive behavior and also some impressive behavioral uh, behavior. Uh, behavioral aspects, which may be uh, indicative of having conscious experiences. Marcus, when you say when you say so many, such a large percentage are nematodes and so on, is that by count or by mass or by both? Oh, that's by yes. <laughs> so <laughs> this, uh, this table is, is uh, that table is this table is mass from a uh, 2018 paper. Uh, but by count, uh, to a first approximation, I think there are 10 to the 27 animals. And to a first approximation, there are 10 to the 27 nematodes. So uh, all animals are nematodes, <laughs> which would be uh, approximately correct. Um, obviously, it is not absolutely true. Um, so our work on uh, understanding invertebrate sentience was inspired in large part uh, by uh, some work done by Open Factory, specifically Luke Mulhauser. Uh, he did some work on consciousness, specifically looking at, uh, well, what's the evidence across a uh, number of species that these, these animals are conscious. But he was looking at all animals, uh, and so he included human chimps, uh, as this table suggests, cow chickens. Uh, he included a couple uh, invertebrates, chick, uh, crabs, and uh, fruit fly. Uh, and he, uh, which was unusual for this type of literature, looked at a rather broad set of uh, features that were to be relevant. Uh, and we took that approach and added a lot more features uh, and specifically narrowed down on invertebrates. Uh, I'm, I'll get to what specific invertebrates we, we captured, but we also, because invertebrates, uh, some of them are rather, uh, rather simple creatures, you, you want to be sure that you're not just fooling yourself. So we gather information on what crap, things that we broadly consider not to be conscious. So if uh, you might look at, a, 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 look at a behavior that you think, well, this may be relevant, but what if a plant can do it too? Right. Mm -hmm. What a prokaryote can do it, or what if uh, protists, uh, which are a uh, kind of motley crew of uh, organisms, what if they're capable of doing it, even though they're largely single cells? So it's, it wouldn't be very impressive if uh, protists can do something that you think is relevant to for sentience. sentience. I also gathered some on chickens and cows to kind of get a little comparison of uh, how, uh, how, say, honeybees perform next to cows. And uh, finally, we, we gathered information on humans, which is uh, as a spoiler alert, it's yes across the board on all the features. Um, but uh, things that happen unconsciously in humans is perhaps a more interesting case. Hmm. Um, so what features are relevant? This is an enormously complex philosophical topic that I'm not, I'm barely going to dive into. Uh, but very broadly, we, we, we categorize things uh, in this way uh, where I, I don't need to get into. All of these, some of these are quite clear, like and, and, uh, evolutionary features of like, how distant are they to humans, or like, uh, are they motile at all? Because we can't move, it's hard to argue that evolutionary speaking, there'd be a good reason for you to experience pain. Uh, whereas some things like uh, drug responses, there are a number of possible drug responses that you, you, uh, could be indicative of you have experiencing suffering, including uh, responses to uh, opiates and analgesics in general. Uh, so uh, unlike anesthetics, which uh, suggest uh, prevent signals being sent back to your spine from wherever the lo location is, Energetics are, in theory, in, in mammals, they, they, they work by uh, preventing 
neurological, neurological process in, in your brain. So if, 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 if uh, animal responds to morphine, for example, it may be a good sign that uh, the reason they're responding is because of uh, they're actually having a painful experience. So there are caveats around that. Uh, that <laughs> Uh, you feel, feel free to ask me questions about why that may not always be the case. Uh, some of the other things around the mood state are just like, do they seem to do they seem to have irritation when when certain things happen? Or kind uh, of sophistication is also very general, but there are a number of things where we brought in intelligence is correlated with uh, uh, sentience, where if you you can solve certain mazes or you can uh, solve certain problems, it may be more uh, evidence that you are actually capable of experiencing uh, symptoms. Um, so there are a huge number of limitations. Uh, I, I don't at all have time to get into all, all the possible drawbacks of the literature, uh, but there are, uh, uh, we looked at 53 features. That wasn't necessarily the definitive set we chose at the very beginning, but there's only so much evidence on some, some, some of these features, and there's only, uh, there's only so much evidence on any individual animal, so uh, or individual taxon, I should say. Uh, so uh, we we brought we tried to incorporate all the, the best evidence we could in, in, include blanks when the data says that there's no evidence. But there's uh, so much more we could have done. Uh, and I I very specifically we very specifically limited cognitive features to things that like uh, inverters could possibly do. I didn't include uh, like the ability to program like a uh, Turing complete machine because that would be silly. Uh, even though humans are capable of doing this, uh, some of them at least. Um, <laughs> so this is actually the full list of features. I'm, I'm not at all going to go over this. This is for the completionists in the room. If you want to come back to this later, feel free to do so. Uh, or if uh, you want me to come back to this later, I can also come back. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, we took all of this, and we, we, combined, we compiled this information to a giant uh, interactive table where you can uh, filter what you like away uh, and say, say I'm only interested in uh, uh, not just stimuli reactions, which is things where things that happen after an animal is injured, uh, and you can say, like, just look at that, or just look at certain species. Uh, this is just the default view. Uh, this, this looks a bit silly to do, like, walk through pictures of an interactive table. Nonetheless, you can, as, you can, as I said, you can filter out what you'd like to see. Uh, so, uh, very broadly, if you have like, a different theory of consciousness than the one someone else is working with, you can use this information as you see fit. Uh, okay, so which inverters did we have to cover? Uh, so, uh, that list, oh, this, this, uh, this table is both the list of uh, species we covered, or taxon, um, because uh, it's very important to think about that because the number of species varies very widely uh, between some of these different groups, such that, uh, say, for uh, for C. elegans, which is uh, mentioned a very studied species, there's a single single one. Uh, but within, say, spiders, they're not very well studied, and there's not a lot of information there. It's a, the extreme case where there are uh, more than 40,000 um, more than 40,000 species of spider. Mm -hmm. But that's the best we can do at this, uh, given the say that is. Uh, some of the other ones that are a bit more reasonable. We, of course, um, uh, I guess. I, I don't care in the abstract if a species, a class of animals has a, has a certain trait of capability. What I care about is if the individuals within that species have the ability to do something. It, do, it doesn't say a lot, like uh, some of the big reviews in this field have previously done, uh, say checked off uh, for, well, uh, can insects respond to not a similar And they check it off like, for all of insects, which is just not a useful, it's just, it's not a useful trait. It's, it's like the equivalent of doing so for well, can can mammals play chess? Like yes, some mammals can play chess, but that's not very useful information. Um, so uh, I'm going to get uh, into a couple of examples of uh, these specific ones, uh, very very specifically uh, affected by analgesics in moving humans. I think this is a particularly strong indicator uh, because uh, you can tell a story about why this may happen uh, without some conscious processing of what's going on. But you can also tell a very good story about why it wouldn't be the case if, uh, only if uh, you're actually experiencing uh, pain. Uh, Self-control is like the, the marshmallow test. Uh, so if any of you've ever heard of that, uh, it's when you put a child, small child in a room with a marshmallow uh, and you say, like, if you, if you eat this marshmallow right now, you only get one, but if you wait 15 minutes, you get two. Uh, so uh, that type of uh, willingness to wait for uh, for uh, larger rewards down the line is a good indicator, well, a possible indicator that uh, there's some conscious processing going on. 
Uh, and uh, I'm going to flag that flexible tool use is kind of a uh, distinction from any tool use at all, from uh, some animals use things that they evolve alongside of in an environment, but this would be something uh, set above, above that, even though uh, the step is somewhat subjective. Uh, it would be the ability to say, like, use something that you haven't evolved with, like that octopus using the coconut shells. Um, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 uh, all right. I, I, skip, I skip by. Again, a uh, ton of limitations here. They're publishing bias, epistemic uncertainty. Um, Many of these features come in degrees, and for that reason, we actually went uh, instead of going yes, no, animals possess these features. Uh, we went like from uh, went from likely no to likely yes on a scale uh, with, with four traits. Uh, but again, there there's a uh, I'll definitely get to the the physical differences play a role here in interpreting some of this evidence. Okay, so finally, what are some actual examples? Uh, so. Honeybees, uh, this uh, may be uh, something you may be aware, they're uh, generally considered very social creatures, but on an individual level, they do a lot of interesting things. Uh, a dose-dependent response to morphing is fascinating to me. Uh, this, this suggests that, uh, uh, obviously I'm very nerdy, interested in that topic, but uh, dose-dependent response to morphing suggests uh, the, the more morphing you give them, the more, uh, like, uh, the more, the more resistant they are to the, the, the damage that does them. So like they, they lift less, they may uh, lay around less. Uh, sim similarly, they groom themselves when they expose to toxins. You can tell a very plausible um, uh, evolutionary perspective about why that might happen. Uh, but um, visual visual learning is something that's actually <coughs> not that common even in like two year olds, right? It's hard to get a, get a toddler to watch something and then just demonstrate that behavior. And yet uh, bumblebees, which are not honeybees, I should the crew has already been uh, shown. There's actually a very great video of this, which is like, uh, in my notes here. But uh, it's also on our, on our site in the table. Uh, so you, you can train a bumblebee to, uh, with a fake bumblebee, and like have it uh, learn, learn a certain behavior, and then that behavior will be emulated uh, by bumblebee watching it, and then the government can watch, and so on. In fact, it can get better and better at the task, uh, even uh, developing uh, paths that weren't in place. So, um, and finally, that, that last one there, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Mark Miller test, if you have the ability to, to, uh, to take a delayed reward, this is a sign that like, you, have, you have at least over some, some theory of your, your existing, like, possibly. It's possible that you have some theory existing over time or, or that you have uh, some type of utility function, uh, whether that be uh, conscious or not. Uh, and also, it's very notable that they perform better than rats, which are mammals, and pigeons, which are birds generally considered. Be conscious um, uh, to take acts for the moment uh, as contrast. There's just this is a very common thing in this table. There's just no evidence on um, uh, acts taking analgesics in response to pain. Um, uh, they do also bring themselves when, when exposed to pathogens, but uh, one interesting thing about ants is they use tools that are not natural to the environment, like uh, sponges or uh, I think in one one experiment there was uh, honey that's diluted with water. And they use this to transfer food uh, between locations. Also, again, there's no studies on um, ants using self control. Um, to go from insects to uh, perhaps much more uh, readily accessible or, or likable uh, in the general public eyes, uh, octopuses. So, octopuses, interestingly, have no known analgesics. This is not from lack of testing, we just don't know uh, if they're possible to. To uh, get them to display some bad behaviors. Um, on the other hand, um, they can regrow limbs. So, what does this even mean? Uh, it's very unclear what it means uh, to do wound guarding when you can grow your limbs back. Um, so, um, as, as I showed the picture showed earlier, they can use uh, tools that aren't natural to the environment. Um, and they, they also do, uh, again, something that uh, perhaps not all small children can do. They can follow prey outside of the line of vision. Uh, to, uh, to capture it, so that's interesting. Uh, but these are just studies. They're actually, this is a growing field of research, and actually a lot of lab anecdotes, which I'd be very interested to see uh, how many of these pan out. Uh, uh, Octopuses have been uh, observed doing all, almost all things. Like, it's <laughs> very surprising. Some of you may have seen them open jars, or, uh, or uh, uh, 
uh, camouflage themselves, but they also switch off, switch off the lights. Uh, my personal favorite on this list is deliberately dump, dumping food on the floor in front of a uh, lab technician. So they've been getting uh, frozen crabs uh, as their regular meals, and this is kind of like a, a, a C grade meal for them. So they they didn't like this very much and waited until the lab technician came to the room, like watched, and then just threw it into the floor. <laughs> this is something of any bird that you would see from perhaps dogs, and it's a good indicator of uh, their intelligence. And of course, finally, some of you may have seen, not only have they opened jars, I've seen octopus escape from jars. Uh, they're very clever. Uh, and that, that despite the fact that 60% of their neurons are not in their brain. <laughs> um, so, uh, high level, what does it all really mean? Um, are invertebrates sentient? Uh, maybe. So, I, I, it depends a lot on the specific invertebrate for me. So, octopus, as, as, as I just described, are capable of a lot of intellectual feats or cognitive uh, sophistication, uh, whereas there's not a lot of evidence for uh, the, some of the more uh, seemingly straightforward pain, pain uh, like behaviors. But again, it's unclear what, this, what these behaviors would mean in this context. Um, Evidence for a lot of these creatures is within the last five to ten years, uh, and generally being skeptical, I should expect you should expect some of that evidence to be overturned over time. However, because a lot of these animals hadn't been studied very much until recently, you also should probably expect some new additional evidence to emerge. Uh, so it's kind of hard to say where that's going. But uh, uh, as I said, maybe. But again, there are a lot of invertebrates, so if it's uh, some reasonable probability that gets you in the game and not in a uh, Pascal's buggy in way, where it's some um, infinitesimal prob probability. Uh, there's something like 1 in 20. Uh, these are, you wouldn't like take a uh, 1 in 20 chance that you're going to die in a, in a car ride. You wouldn't take that car ride. Um, so this, this, uh, this chart is a, kind of a high level overview of the specific uh, features we enlisted. Again, this is a, there's some self selection going on here around uh, which features we included around how to sophistication, but very broadly, not very surprisingly, humans making up the, the far right with 100% uh, of the features considered. But then you may notice uh, fruit flies, mm. and uh, fruit flies and honeybees are kind of in the domain of cows and chickens, uh, which is somewhat surprising, which of course does not mean that it's necessarily the case that you should assign the same uh, probability of sentience to fruit flies or cows and chickens, but it does suggest that it's kind of possible that fruit flies and honeybees are sentient. Well, just to clarify, that the percent of the features they have not your confidence in them being confident, right? Yes. Okay. Very much so. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so the case against inverse sentience, um, because you should make this case when you're arguing against uh, arguing perhaps for something uh, it's not very something like a belief is something some combination or some feature up here. So either you can argue that uh, like what, whatever the case may be with this evidence, that it is not sentient. Um, you may argue that like their pains are, then perhaps they're sentient, but their pains are more irrelevant. You may argue that in theory would suggest they are. It's just a reduced to absurdity. Or you may argue that there's just no way if you do anything. So it doesn't even matter if uh, this is the case. Uh, I'd say these are all too overconfident. Uh, this is my personal opinion, but like uh, for honeybees and fruit flies, uh, anything below like one five percent, like it's not credible. Estimate again. This is very subjective, but um, how uh, how confident can you are you really in your moral theory that you're going to like eliminate uh, some uh, creatures that have uh, there are many many times more times numerous than uh, far, many other farm farm animals or animals in general? Um, and I I think I'm very interested in philosophy, but there's a lot of confidence that having Reductio to suggest to just say I'm so confident that invertebrates aren't sentient. That like anyone who says so just disproves their own moral theory. Uh, that's uh, very that's a very strange uh, argument to make with like uh, near 100 percent certainty that you would need in this case. Um, and by the way, the, the basic argument that like you can't do anything like how do you know that? Uh, you have to at least uh, investigate the topic before you can come to that conclusion. Uh, so what can be done? Uh, basically everything. Uh, at, this, at this stage, there's so much more scientific research to do uh, on, on some of these uh, some of these topics that uh, some of these features I've discussed can be uh, way more thoroughly investigated. Obviously, I mentioned that we're covering this usually at a higher than the species level. What matters really is the species level. So, getting more detailed information there, uh, you can uh, analyze the lives of farm invertebrates, which is something uh, I think uh, we are going to do a little bit of. Um, but there's uh, also just like broadly share this information with people. I think it's not, a lot of this information I think may come as a surprise to uh, the people who are even, even uh, well-informed about uh, 
animals in general. Uh, I, I, I could go on, but I'm not going to take time. Uh, so this is just, this is a slide useful for a regular effect. Probably, you can come to my slides and just click through and look at all the, all the information we published on this. Uh, so we, 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 in addition to the actual table, there's a lot about explaining what the features are in uh, considerable depth, and there's also a lot on, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, some things that are, things that have been documented to happen unconsciously in humans, and what does that tell us. Uh, and there's a, finally, we, we ended this, well, we didn't actually end this series, but the most recent post is on, um, uh, just overall, what all this information means and what we can, what we should do. Uh, so, uh, given all that, I want to briefly uh, touch on like what else we're doing. Uh, we're uh, we're doing a lot of things. Uh, specifically, some of you may have seen Solis's uh, recent work on corporate campaigns. Uh, he did cost effectiveness analysis of uh, corporate campaigns in the domain of uh, uh, chickens. Uh, and uh, this this uh, nice graph also helps you. Uh, Right is a is a is a piece from his breakdown on the region, country, and year of those commitments. Uh, Maybe a little hard to make out, but broadly, it's um, countries and industries the commitments having in the total number of commitments. Uh, then you look at globally uh, how successful these things have been and where. Um, we have done work on Waterloo. Our we have a college on staff, uh, Kim Cunningham, who's a professor at the University of Waterloo, and she's been looking at uh, Waterloo for us. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, uh, Lisa Rodriguez, who worked with us, has done some work on nuclear, base, nuclear weapons uh, baseline risk, like which uh, nuclear wars are most likely, uh, and uh, how how bad would they be, uh, how bad would the winter be, whether they're all really bad. Um, and um, we also run the EA study. Uh, so uh, we did all the analysis for the last year in uh, EA survey, I believe is still currently ongoing. Uh, if you're at this meetup, you should probably take the EA survey. Um, cool, that's basically what we're currently working on. Uh, excuse me, that's, that's what else we've done. This is what we're currently working on. Uh, so um, I'm very interested in doubt measures to affect change in animal welfare space. So I'm interested in seeing what, what's the best doubt measures we can do in uh, 2020 and uh, 2022 and going forward. Uh, so I'm interested in polling, doing polling in that space. Uh, there's more counting in animals in the, in the domain of uh, uh, fish locking within the domain of uh, spin-off from uh, solar system water work, uh, counting animals. Uh, there's more invertebrate follow-ups. As I mentioned, there's a lot that could be done in this space. Uh, the picture off to the right here is actually from a coming post from one of our interns, uh, Jacob Schmeich, and he, um, he basically looked at uh, some, food, some food survey data and tried to figure out what, um, how partisan uh, self-identified rates, uh, well, self-identified inaccurate rates of vegetarianism uh, is, uh, and what the trends are in that space. Um, and we're going to do more work in model uh, welfare case studies, a uh, number of uh, surveys, as I mentioned, EA survey, we're also running a uh, replication of, uh, conceptual replication of the Citizens Institute Slaughterhouse uh, survey, something you may be aware of, feel free to ask me in the detail about that later. Also, on, uh, we're doing an open-ended survey of reasons people can be vegetarian, uh, and uh, finally, something actually Will Castle uh, said publicly he was looking forward to, uh, is a survey uh, analyzing uh, how humans uh, value people in the far future. Um, so that's uh, broadly what we're up to. Um, going forward, uh, we are still a young organization. I think we're looking to expand. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, eight-ish full-time equivalent, but we're looking to expand in a number of, number of ways. Uh, uh, improve our, uh, excuse me, uh, expand our operations staff so we could do better and more promising work. Also, bring Peter on, who's my uh, co in the project, on full-time. Uh, yeah, that's probably up to in uh, always, uh, in time here or elsewhere. Pitch me your research ideas. I'm very interested to hear what you think is a good idea, what people should be working on, uh, what you think is promising. Uh, and finally, you can follow that link to our newsletter. Uh, thank you.